Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Susan Hopkins. I am the executive director of the Merit Center, and we are based in Canada. And I am here on the line with you today with uh, the leader of our organization, Thought uh, Heart Science Wise, um, and my good friend and partner, Dr. Stuart Shanker. He will be, <laughs> Stuart will be doing most of the talking today. Uh, we have been invited by uh, Selfreg and, and Stuart's uh, publisher from Poland, Anna, has invited us to do this uh, short webinar with you today, and we will likely be doing more in the future. But before we, st we dove in there, I wanted to just say a few words myself. So the first thing to know is that um, the Merit Center is an organization based in Canada, and you can find us online at self-reg.ca. And we are the heart and home of online self-reg, and definitely self-reg in Canada, but we're working internationally. And we're doing so to such a degree that we are also have decided um, to launch uh, another organization called Self-Reg Global, and I will be sharing more information about that with you in the future. Self-Reg is uh, Dr. Stuart Shanker's game-changing, life-changing framework and method um, that is helping all of us, you and I included, uh, in figuring out everything from behavior to motivation to, you know, why we weren't the perfect parent in a moment to where our empathy goes to what's going on when we think, you know, we're, we're seeing lack of character or... Um, we're seeing explosive behaviors or internalizing behaviors and also where all the hope is and there is a ton and I have to tell you that Poland is a very special country for us. It, you were one of the very first that uh, really started knocking on our door and saying more, 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 more. And you, you really were, I, you know, Stuart has worked all over the, the world um, over the years in his, in his work his early in early childhood and education um, in all of his various areas of expertise, which are many, and we'll uh, include his bio here. And yet there was something very unique about Poland. And so that makes you all very special for us. Uh, Stuart has a personal connection to Poland, which uh, I'll invite him to share. That was part of why it matters so much, but it's also how it unfolded with, with Poland. Um, and I really want to thank Anna, our publisher uh, in Poland, um, who's now published two of two self-reg books um, that are through our official partnership. Um, one is what in English is Calm Alert and Learning, and the original one was uh, Self-reg, which is uh, Stuart's book from 2016 for parenting. Anna was really one of the early leaders internationally. That book is now published in nine or 10 different languages. And Poland was one of the very first. Uh, there was something she saw in it and, some, and a spot that she thought um, could support parenting. And now we're on to educators and really the whole world, all of us ad adults trying to figure this thing out um, in Poland. And so she reached out uh, and that's how we met what we would call our very first self regger in Poland, uh, Natalia, um, and Natalia Fedem, who is the, a psychologist in your country, has, leads mind care, um, and was the translator, and has become part of the movement there. So I just want to thank those two folks um, and tell you that we look forward to working with them more and are very proud of our relationship with them. I would also like to take a moment and just acknowledge all of the incredible self-reggers across Poland, because here's what happened. Because of, of Anna and the publisher, uh, I don't want to mispronounce it, um, I'll, I'll leave that one to Stuart, and then the forward thinking of Natalia, um, who started Mind Care and a Facebook group who got really things moving. We have had dozens and dozens, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the number's not up somewhere around 100. Um, folks from Poland take TMC, the Merit Center courses. I taught, I've, I've met many of them because I facilitated the courses. Um, the first one we had was Foundations, which is a four course program um, to learn really the science and begin to think deeper about what self-reg is. Um, and we look across five domains. Stuart will introduce that to you a bit today. 
Um, but we've also had, had folks take our ECD course, our early childhood development course. I believe we have one or two in our new school leader course. Um, we've had many that have gone on to take um, our level two course, um, which is, it's a learning facilitators course. And that is, it takes about 10 months, uh, you know, to finish. And it is done with a group of people from around the world online. Um, and it, it's, it's how folks earn a certificate. It means they have gone a little deeper in their learning of self-reg. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, that, 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 you know, we're off to teach a university course on it or anything like that. I've been studying with Stuart for 10 years and I'm still learning all the time, but it does mean that they've gone deeper into their learning and they've had time and experience practicing how to bring that to other people. Um, and so we have uh, about 500 people around the world who've taken that certificate with us. And we're very proud that many of you are in Poland as well. So without further ado, I just wanted to say a few words. Thank all of the self-reggers, all of the passionate people in Poland um, who, who saw something in self-reg that might just help you understand help you see parenting differently, help you see early childhood educating differently, help you see schools and teaching, um, help you think about things like politics and democracy and you know, well-being of communities differently and are advocating for more self-reg. We're with you and uh, very proud to be so. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Stuart. And I do, by the way, you may be wondering why I'm not referring to Stuart as Dr. Shanker and it's not just because of our close working relationship. Um, one of the things he does ask me, I honored his, his bio and his title, and you'll see all of that along with this. Um, but Stuart also uh, really likes to be addressed and, uh, you know, as he's doing some of these conversations, um, it's with you, um, it's not to you. And so I'm intentionally using the language of Stuart. So with that, over to you, Stuart. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good morning, everyone. Jen Dobry. Um, as Susan hinted, my grandmother was Polish. Uh, I have no idea how good my accent is. I only know that every time I tried to speak Polish with my grandmother, she would put her hands over her ears and sort of ululate. Uh, so uh, that may partly be because my father was priming me by teaching me how to swear in Polish, which I can do fairly fluently. Uh, um, in any event, uh, today I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about self-reg in English and uh, give you an overview of what self-reg is all about. So we start off with the basic principle that self-reg is about under understanding and not managing behavior. Now there's a background to this. Uh, I ran a research clinic for many years at York University and one half of our clinic was um, staffed by psychologists and therapists and the other half by neuroscientists. And what we were interested in was why. Why is a child having tantrums or why is a child aggressive or why is a child crying a lot or um, why is this child having so much trouble learning, um, you know, doing well in school when we could tell that the child was very intelligent. Um, and at a deeper level, we used this, we asked why of ourselves. Um, why in certain situations do I have this incredible um, craving for, say, ice cream or, or rich cake? And even if I want to um, stop myself from indulging, I find it next to impossible and end up gorging. So we had lots and lots of whys. And what we realized really the reason why we created this clinic, which was called Mary, was that in order to really get effective ways of dealing with these various kinds of behaviors, we had to understand where they were coming from, what they were telling us. And to answer those questions, uh, we really did go very deep inside the brain to see what was going on. 
And what became clear to me quite some time ago, and the reason I was given funding for the Institute, is that what we were looking at was the effect of excessive stress. Now, this is an important point. Self-reg is not, a, it's not a intended to get rid of stresses in our life. We need stress. We thrive on stress. But there has been an explosion in a number of sciences over the last 30 years that have each of them looked at the effects of excessive stress. So the sciences that we, uh, that we probe in our foundations courses that Susan mentioned are principally neuroscience, physiology, or a branch of physiology called psychophysiology, psychology, of course, and finally, clinical practice. And in each of these sciences, what we see emerging as we go back to, roughly speaking, the 1990s, is a growing awareness that A, we have incredible levels of stress in modern life, and B, that when that stress becomes excessive, it results in the kinds of behaviors that I mentioned at the outset. So what we're going to do in self-reg is we're going to introduce you to all sorts of distinctions that are grounded in this idea. A fundamental distinction is between misbehavior and stress behavior. So stress behavior, those are the behaviors that I've mentioned already. Those are the behaviors that are caused by excessive stress. And the reason this distinction is so fundamental is because if we don't understand the difference between misbehavior and stress behavior, and we treat something that our child or our student has done as a misbehavior, when in fact it was really a stress behavior, we can make things significantly worse for that child. And in fact, what we've seen in what we saw in our clinic um, when we worked with children that were really having quite a lot of trouble in life was that they had been consistently mistreated, consistently either their caregivers or their educators, or maybe it could have been other adults in their life like a coach, um, had uh, punished them on the thinking, on the understanding that they were misbehaving when in fact it was a stress behavior. So what you're going to learn in self-reg is what Susan's already alluded to, uh, and that is a five-step method, the, the Shanker self-reg method, for not just managing stress behavior, but understanding stress behavior and really transforming the trajectory that a child under excessive stress is under so that that child will thrive. And when I say thrive, what's very important for self-reg are the different domains that it covers. And we talk about the five domains of self-reg and you'll learn these. But basically what we're looking at is not just, you know, the child's social emotional well-being, which is very important for us, but also their cognitive development, their learning their ability to pay attention, to remember things. And then we go a little deeper and we look at their ability to experience empathy. And finally, we look at their character. We're looking at whether they become responsible, whether they, be, whether they have the capacity to, for want of a better word, um, really deliberate carefully over the serious decisions that they make as they get older and whether they develop a, uh, an upright moral character. So my point here is simply to plant in your minds the scope of self-reg. We're really looking at the whole child or the whole teenager. But having said that, we realized early on, Susan and I realized early on that self-reg really starts with self. It really starts with your understanding 
of your own stress behaviors. Why and when you are uh, uh, having a stress behavior and what you can do to return yourself to that sort of calm, um, uh, rational state, which is our best state, not just for being healthy ourselves or having our own thought processes given full, full scope, but it's in that state where we can best engage with a child, where we can best do self-reg with a child. Because so often, as you'll learn, um, the important messages that we give a child are not the language ones. They're the nonverbal messages, the things we communicate th to the child uh, through our eyes, through our gestures, through our facial expressions. Children really pick up these before they even start to process the words that we're using. That's a sort of overview. And now I want to just go a little bit deeper into the substantial part of self reg As I mentioned, we draw all sorts of distinctions in self reg And perhaps the very first one and the fundamental one that we draw is between self-control and self-regulation. Now you'll have to spend a bit of time learning about the nature of these two very different concepts. And they really are very different. Self-control is an ancient concept. It actually goes back to the Bible, uh, certainly to the Greeks. Whereas self-regulation is a relatively, it's a relatively modern concept. You can find intimations of it, interestingly, in our Aristotle. But the concept itself was um, properly sort of uh, introduced at the beginning of the 20th century by an American physiologist, uh, a man called Walter Bradford Cannon. And it really transformed the way scientists at the end of the 20th century began to look at learning behavior and emotion. So what is self-regulation? That's your first question. What is, why is this so important? Okay, well, self-control is fairly easy for us to define. Self-control is this idea that we have to make an effort through willpower, through some sort of mental effort to control, to inhibit our impulses. So if I have an impulse, like I said, to eat the whole quart of ice cream, and I know that this is bad for me, I know that I'll gain weight from this, then I have to exercise willpower to stop myself. The problem that I think all of you can identify with is that really isn't very effective. In fact, it turns out that not only does self-control, does a self-control mindset lead to all sorts of problems in its own right, but it doesn't even help us very much with the thing we were so intent on controlling. So we need a different way of, of looking at these issues, a different way of looking at these behaviors. And that's where self-reg comes in, self-regulation. Now, self-regulation itself is a fairly complex uh, concept. And by that, what I mean is uh, I'm referring to a study that we did a couple of years ago, led by Jeremy Berman, and which we identified 447 different definitions of self-regulation. So if you were to go on the internet today and look up self-regulation, the odds are you will all have a very different understanding of what self-regulation uh, consists in. But these 447 different definitions of them, 446 of them are variations on self-control. The idea is in one way or another that a child who learns how to self-regulate is learning how, for example, to control his thoughts, his emotions, his attention. But that's not actually what the original definition, the one I referred to that uh, Cannon 
presented at the beginning of the 20th century. That's not what he had in mind. What Cannon was thinking of was that self-regulation refers to how we manage stress. Now, I have to introduce a very important qualification here. The way Cannon talked about it, self-regulation is what philosophers call a theory-neutral term. And what that means is that self-regulation um, isn't something like good. It's, it does, we don't use the term to refer to, I don't know, say a milestone that a child needs to pass when they're four or five years old. Um, and you could say, well, this child can't self-regulate and this child can, and this child who can self-regulate gets a sticker in his report card. No, self-regulation, by saying it's theory neutral, what we're saying is there are good ways that we manage stress and not so good ways. In fact, in some cases, we may manage stress in very bad ways. Uh, an example would be um, someone who has to rely on drugs to deal with the stresses in their life. So that leads us to, again, one of the fundamental distinctions that we draw in self reg And that, this distinction I want to talk about is between maladaptive and adaptive modes of self-regulation. So what's a maladaptive? Well, I gave you an example, eating the, eating the bucket of ice cream. That certainly is a way of dealing with stress. We know that the actual cold texture is soothing. The sucking stimulates, is, is soothing because it stimulates a couple of neurohormones that are calming. And the sugar itself is soothing. It produces a calming effect. So as far as dealing with stress goes, why not eat a bucket of ice cream? Why would Stewart say that it's maladaptive? Well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, the stress relief that the bucket of ice cream provides is very short-lived. Um, it really only lasts for about 20 to 30 minutes. So that means that we get that brief sort of respite from our stress, but then it comes back again. But then, of course, there are other side effects. Um, and there's the fact that I gain weight, uh, which I don't want because of all the associated problems that we see with being overweight. Or we can say the problem is that I actually become what's called habituated to the sugar. And what that means um, in simple en English or Polish, if this is being translated, is that the benefits actually quickly wear off, that stress relief wears off. So before I know it, uh, I have to eat two buckets or I have to find other ways of reproducing that initial calming effect that I had. So that's a bad effect. And then there's the impact of all this sugar on my bloodstream. So again, we, go, we'll, we can go into this, but um, sugar really can't go very high in the blood, or glucose can't go too high in the bloodstream. So there's a system in the brain that monitors blood glucose levels. And when it starts to go too high, it triggers other metabolic processes to get rid of that high sugar level. And these other metabolic processes are very draining on us. They're very taxing. So for all sorts of reasons, sugars, eating, eating a lot of sugar is really a very poor way of dealing with the stresses that you're under. And we see this pattern in children. In fact, we see this pattern in very young children. So very young children can adopt what are actually maladaptive ways of dealing with the stresses in their life. Even a baby can do this. So in our 
in our research lab, we work with many children who found social interaction very stressful. And their way of dealing with this stress was to shut down. But that's maladaptive. And it's maladaptive because you need social interaction to learn, to learn language or to learn facial expressions or, or to learn nonverbal cues. All kinds of things can only be learned by a young child through social interaction. So what we had to do in the lab, what the therapist had to do, was see if they could replace that shutting down with a much more adaptive way of dealing with the stress. Now, I should just mention very quickly that to do this properly meant that we had to work with the parents as much as with the with the baby or the infant. And this is an important point, and you'll learn it as we go through and introduce you to how uh, development in a young child is very much a function of, of what's called a dyad. Uh, so we'll introduce you to these ideas about how the child's earliest modes of dealing with stress are a function of their early interactions with their caregivers. The problem that we see with, let's say now, slightly older children, toddlers or children going to school that, have, um, that are having problems interacting with other children or sitting still or learning lessons that their peers seem to learn fairly easily, the problem is that their maladaptive stress patterns have already become fairly entrenched. Now, the good news is that there is no point in the lifespan where we cannot change an entrenched maladaptive mode of self-regulation. We can even do this with the elderly. The elderly are just as vulnerable to developing uh, maladaptive modes of self-regulation. In fact, many of the maladaptive modes that they adopt are quite similar to the maladaptive modes that we see infants adopt. But the good news is that by understanding, by becoming aware that something is a stress, why it is a stress, and how to, def how to deal with that stress effectively, we, in a mindful manner, we can, we can shift from maladaptive to adaptive. There is never a point in the lifespan where this is not possible. We use various tools to explain how this is possible. And our most important and our most effective tools come from neuroscience. And of all the neuroscientific discoveries or theories that have influenced us, one of the most important is this triune brain, which is an idea that first appeared in the 1960s and then led Paul McLean to publish a very famous book called The Triune Brain in 1990, in which he introduced us to this idea that the human brain is really three brains in one, hence the term triune. The three brains that he had in mind were, uh, if you look at this picture that I hope you have in front of you, um, you see that brown brain, above it a red brain, and above that a blue brain. And those colors were taken from our neuroscience lab at Mary. Um, literally, those are the colors that appear when you do imaging of a brain. And McLean's idea was that that brown brain is really a very ancient brain, what he called a reptilian brain. So this is a brain that evolved a couple of hundred million years ago that enabled reptiles, so snakes, turtles, um, that enabled these very ancient pre-social creatures to monitor their environment for danger and adopt 
really one of two defensive uh, behaviors to deal with threat. One of them was to attack the threat, to fight it. And the other one was to flee the threat. So in psychology, we refer to this as a fight or flight mechanism. This mechanism is so effective at dealing with threat that according to McLean, when about 100 million years later, mammals appeared, their new brain, the red brain that you see, what he called a paleomammalian brain, sits on top of that reptilian brain. Now, the point I mentioned briefly a second ago is that that reptilian brain is pre-social. It's a brain designed for solitary organisms, what are known as singletons. They don't live in groups. They don't nurture their offspring. They live, they, they bury themselves in the mud in winter and then emerge from the mud and forage in the spring. These are, these are pre-social creatures, but mammals are social. And that's the key. That's what the term mammal is drawing attention to. Mammals are so called because there is now a mother or a caregiver that nurtures her babies until they are old enough and strong enough to go out on their own. So with mammals, we get the first mother offspring uh, bond, and we have various mechanisms for that bond. But in addition, these mammals live in groups. So this red brain has to do a couple of things. The one thing it has to do is it has to nurture its babies. But the other thing it has to do is it has to get along with the other members of the group. But here you have a problem. And the problem is maybe some of the members of the group are threats themselves. Or maybe you come in, contract, in contact with another group that is a threat. So this red brain, in addition to child rearing, also develops mechanisms for identifying when a conspecific, a member of the same group, is a friend or foe, a threat or a source of a source of support. So this red brain, this mammalian brain, begins to scan its social environment, not just the physical environment, but also the social environment. And it develops mechanisms for identifying friend or foe, threat or ally. And finally, we get this blue brain. And in McLean's model, this blue brain evolved sometime around four or five million years ago. It came from a common ancestor. It went through many uh, adaptations until we get to modern Homo sapiens around 150,000, 200,000 years ago. And the idea here is this blue brain not only sits on top of the brown brain and the red brain, but the blue brain has its own special uh, suite of mechanisms for problem solving. So this is the brain that thinks. This is the brain that has language. This is the brain that becomes very aware of what's going on inside itself. It becomes self-aware, conscious. So in McLean's evolutionary scenario, this blue brain is the seat of our rationality. The red brain is the irrational and the brown brain is the non-rational, pre-rational. Now we've had a lot of neuroscience in the last 30 years and we now know that the idea that there is you know, three brains in one, each with a specific set of tasks, is a little too simplistic. Really, in any 
uh, task that you might want to study as a neuroscientist, you find that all three levels of the brain are involved, that the brain really is a whole organism, very complex organ. But for our purposes in self-reg, what we can see is that the processes that McLean identified with each can dominate at any, in any particular moment or in any task. So when we talk about the blue brain dominating, what we mean is that the thinking parts of the brain, the communicative parts of the brain are really in charge. When the brown brain, the reptilian brain, is in charge, when it dominates, for example, in times of uh, acute danger, battle, what happens is it's very interesting that it actually, it doesn't simply seize control, it actually shuts down the thinking parts of the brain, the, the language parts of the brain. But for our purposes in self reg the one we're really interested in is that middle brain, that red brain. Because what we find is that that red brain constantly influences. Even when the blue brain is dominant, it influences blue brain processes. This is the especially important when we're working with children because for the young child the part of their brain that's dramatically underdeveloped is that blue brain it's the part that will grow quite radically and continue growing it sort of stabilizes around the ages of 8 to 10 but it continues to grow or to refine its connections until quite old and so the modern thinking now is around the ages of 22 to 24 years old. But all this time, the red brain, which is the source of not just strong emotions, not just impulses, but this red brain also has its own mode of scanning the world for safety or danger. Remember that we were talking about mammals having to have a brain that could identify through, uh, that could identify when a conspecific was a, a friend or a foe. So this form of perception has been studied intensively over the last, uh, since the early 90s, especially by Joseph Ledeux. Now, how does this, how does this, red brain do it? Well, it does it by listening very carefully to tones of voice, or it notices little things like a gesture or the kind of movement or posture. It is constantly scanning conspecifics to see if they're safe or danger by looking at all these subtle nonverbal cues. And this is what's going on with a child. This form of perception is going on even before they have language. We call this neuroception. And what it means is that the child is constantly listening to our tone of voice even before they can speak and even after they can speak. They listen to how high our voice is, how quickly we speak, um, they listen to how many breaths we take, or they look at our eyes, they look at our pupils, or maybe they look at how we're standing or our facial expression. All these things are going on as we engage with the child. And if they sense danger, if we are sending some sort of a message, which is a threat message, this has an incredible effect on the blue brain. This has an incredible effect on how they behave, how they learn, how they listen, how they speak. So what we learn in self-reg are really five fundamental steps. And the first step we're going to learn is how to reframe a child's behavior. 
Now, what that means is whenever a child does something that we find annoying or puzzling or maybe even scary, before we punish, before we yell, before we shout, before we try to manage that behavior, we ask ourselves, why? Why are we seeing this behavior? Is this a misbehavior or a stress behavior? If our answer is that it's a stress behavior, we go on to step two. And step two is we're going to figure out what the stresses are. Now, stress is a very complicated topic. And we'll go over this carefully with you. There are, we look at stress in five different domains. And we become what we describe as stress detectives. Because what we're really interested in are the subtle the often hidden stresses that a child was, is dealing with. So you'll learn that. You'll learn the difference between a, an obvious stress, an overt stress, and a hidden stress. Then step three of our method, of the Shanker self reg method, is how do I reduce these stresses? We are not trying to put our child in some sort of a stress-free bubble. What we're trying to do is reduce the stresses that we can so that our child or our student can deal with the stresses that he or she must. What we're looking for here is reducing a stress load that has become excessive so that the child can successfully deal with those stresses that are critical for mental growth, emotional growth, physical growth. The next step, the sort of pivotal step is self-awareness. It's not enough that we understand what's going on in the child. The child has to be able to understand this himself or herself. They have to know what it feels like to be calm, what it feels like to be overstressed, and to recognize when they are becoming overstressed and why. One of the questions I've been asked, probably more than any other question, is how young can a child be when they start to learn this? And what we found in our lab was the answer is as young as three, three years old. And then the last step is how do we introduce restorative practices? Restorative for the child, restorative for the child's caregiver, restorative for the teacher. And here what we're looking for is how can we introduce, how can we adopt daily practices which not only enable them to deal much more effectively with the stresses in their life, which enable them to thrive, but which really set them up to approach each day in a positive frame of mind in a positive mindset where they truly can thrive. And I want to take this full circle now and return to what I said at the very start. All of this becomes possible when you do it for yourself. This is what we're after. We're after you having that, that sense, that restorative sense of a full tank of energy, not too much tension, so that you can really deal with joy and not just effectively with, your, with the children, with the students, with your friends, with your parents, with everyone in your life so that we all, I want to say, become not just calm, not just um, intelligent, but we are all joined in our common commitment to creating a just society. It starts with us, and then we do this with every single child, one child at a time. Last thing I'll say to you, if there's one thing we've learned, and it's the motto that Susan's chosen for our organization, it is... There is no such thing as a bad kid.
I've seen a lot of kids, they all have this extraordinary potential to have a meaningful life and a life full of meaning. Okay, so good luck everybody. And next time I'll speak some more Polish with you. Thank you very much, Stuart. I, I have listened to Stuart talk more times than I can count. And every time I hear something new, uh, it's something that lifts me up, not just in terms of someone who's interested in the science and bringing this to the world, but as a mom and a human being. And so a couple of things I just want to pull out of uh, what Stuart just shared. First of all, if that sparked anything in you and an interest to learn more, there are many ways to learn more. Uh, we're looking at more possibilities in Poland right now, but the very first step is buy, buy one of the books. So Stuart's book, Self Reg, is a book for parents, and he he goes in uh, to very deeply with stories and many examples and some practical how tos in that book, and as well as the Common Alert and Learning, which is for educators. But honestly, both books, I have to tell you, we have many educators that read Self Reg because there's a lot that we can learn in there, and we have many parents and folks that are working with children, especially if you have. Uh, children that challenge you in some ways. Uh, it was really um, the big spark for me as well. So I just want to say that. The other thing that I want to say uh, is that, you know, when we hear Stuart speak, one thing I want you to know is that as, you know, part of this is beginning to recognize it's not about understanding every bit of the science or being able to explain all of it, uh, even just the little bit that you heard here today. It's about beginning to realize there's more and that's where the hope comes right it's not because we're trying it's because everything we're trying to do and we've been trying to do isn't working and that can feel very frustrating you know what do we do what do we do when our kids are having meltdowns all the time or they're shutting down or we can't get them off technology um you know or they're taken off out the door and we told them no or they're doing things that you know worry us what, what do we do well, the very first thing is we begin to see it differently. And we also have to begin to see ourselves differently. So if you lear are learning something here and you're like, you had an aha moment, as Stuart was telling you about, I don't know, red brain, blue brain, and brown brain, for example, and you're like, oh, that, it's not the moment for you to say, oh, I should have, could have, I should have <laughs> differently. We both do that too. Um, you know, but I, you know, it's part of being human, but that's not what this is about. Uh, and I have to tell you, as you learn more, you know, the instant question people will ask is, what are my strategies? And I'm going to actually give you three simple ones today, three things you can do. But I have to tell you, it's not about a bucket full of strategies. Um, it is, you are the strategy, um, is one thing to know. And that, you, that how you see, not just what in, in your children, in your neighbors, in your colleagues, in your partners, what, what you see. Uh, that's why learning is so important. How we once we begin to see differently, we see everything differently, and so that's a really important one. But this is not about guilt; it's about understanding. So that's that's one that I want you to know. Um, and the other thing is that this is not just about concepts and ideas. Uh, we are seeing people changing how they see the world, how they see themselves, and we're seeing impact on everything from child development to educational outcomes to I mean, people are using this in, uh, for their own health and well-being, losing weight, these sorts of things. When you begin to look at things differently, um, there's, there's sort of no area that, that doesn't shift. So a couple of things I just want to leave you with, and I made a few notes as Stuart was talking, if you're wondering why I'm looking down here. But one of your big, you know, if you want to take just one strategy, one, one idea from today, beyond the fact you need to learn more, you really do. <laughs> and uh, there are some some info sheets translated mind care has those um, they're on our website in polish we have a few you know so you can read some things in polish there are the books um, as, as i said uh, this you know is a resource for you but learning more will really help um, because you begin to see everything differently but it's this idea of the pause and asking why and why now and that's not saying you ask the child, hey, why and why now did you just, you know, throw that across the room, right? It's, they don't know, really, they don't. It's, it's, it's a reflective pause, most of the time, anyway. And, and look, you may say, I want to do that, but in the moment, you know, I lose my temper. 
Well, then you say, why, why now afterwards, right? That's all you can do. And it, you, what you'll find is this, every time you take this pause and go, hmm, why and why now? Um, and begin to reflect. You'll begin to notice other things and it does change. You'll develop some of this, this thinking will begin to happen more and more naturally. Um, so that's one of the things that I wanted to, to suggest to you. Um, but then I have three strategies, uh, three simple ones, and I'm going to ask Stuart to sort of weigh in. He may want to add something more. Um, I want you to hear, though, that he talked about those five steps of self-reg. That is self-reg. Learning to reframe behavior. That's your why and why now. Recognizing stressors across five domains, and it's not as simple as saying, oh, I'm worried about money. There's more, right? L reducing the stress and finding all the ways to lighten those stress backpacks. Reflect right, and develop that stress awareness and that restorative piece is step five. So there's, there really is, and there's a lot more to learn. So these are simple ones that sort of fit in to those as a starting place, but they also acknowledge that right now um, we're living, as we're filming this, we're living through, um, you know, the pandemic. And that's part of why we wanted to do this right now. And I have to tell you in my community, Stuart lives about an hour from me, and right here where I am, there's been 51 cases. So and we're in, wow. we're in lockdown and taking it very, very seriously. Um, but that's very different from what's in Europe. And yet I've been watching Poland. I watch all the countries and I can see, you know, you are somewhere in the middle. I lived in Milan, Italy for four years, which as you all know, is one of the centers of what's going on. And I have, it was almost 20 years ago now, but well, it was 20 years ago now. Um, but I have many friends who are reaching out and my heart goes out to you. And we realize that this is a very unusual time. So self break applies to us at any time and everything we've talked about today um, will apply. It applied two years ago. It'll apply two years from now, but the context changes. And I just want you to become very aware of that as, as, as folks that I'm assuming many of you are staying home now. Um, and that your, your world has been changed in ways that you didn't expect even just four months ago, um, you know, and for those of you that are working frontline, thank you for what you do. Um, and I just want you to begin to really think about the fact that this brings out, these are added stress, stressors. It's not all negative. Sometimes it's, I've enjoyed having more time with my daughter, um, but it does, it has changed things. And, and so we can really use this in this time. And, and so once you begin learning self-reg, it's not like you get everything perfect. We self-regers can still find ourselves judging somebody that we think a whole lot about. Ah, reframe the behavior. Why am I judging? You know, I'm overstressed in the moment. The other day, yesterday, you know, I'm working from home. You can see I have a nice home. I have a nice big backyard. My daughter's 12 and she's doing quite well. My part, you know, we're doing fairly well. I'm one of the lucky ones. I told you my community's not in an outbreak and we have about 80,000 people. So that's pretty good for 50, you know, to have just 51. And yet yesterday I found myself doing these things and it took me a while. I didn't catch myself in the moment to realize it was actually over stress, right? It wasn't about any of these things. I felt myself a little bit frustrated with my daughter's teachers who are trying to homeschool, <laughs> who are trying to do these sort of emergency by distance. And in retrospect, she has two. They, 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 share a, they share two grade six classrooms. So that's 12 year olds. They're terrific. <laughs> They're doing wonderful things. I saw it totally different today. You know, they asked me my opinion yesterday, you know, on a survey to parents. And, you know, I was a little bit, right? That's not typically me. You know, they, these, these folks are doing their very best. I was grumpy with my daughter. Like it really was. I was frustrated to find her on technology again. So it's a little thing. You might be dealing with much more than I am. I'm just giving you my example. I was kind of a little bit testy, right? So, and I did a couple of things yesterday that were not really, you know, I was shorter. I was having a hard time focusing. I didn't get, I had a bunch of stuff on my to-do list. I couldn't get through it because I couldn't focus. I went to read at night, which is a really important part of my self-reg. And, and I couldn't, I kept reading the page and I read the page and it'd be gone. Right. I had to go back and edit a, a bunch of posts I put on our online school because I realized they'd come across abrupter. These are really huge things, but they're all examples of how the stress was actually building on me in a whole bunch of different ways. And I just hadn't noticed it in the moment. So you might be noticing things like your kids are, you know, saying mean things or, um, 
you know, I had my daughter the other day in tears. Like she went from being, she's dealing with it really well to sort of being this little girl who needed nurturing. Well, that's part of this journey too, right? Um, I had a situation a few days ago of somebody um, that I have a ton of respect for that kind of lost their cool. Uh, and I, I now I see what that, that was. It's affecting all of us. So notice that. If you're suddenly sort of, you know, home with your partner all the time and you're fighting with each other more, well, things have changed, right? And so how can we begin to think about this through self-reg? And these are three things that you could do or have a look at. So the first one um, is think about your routines. And I don't mean a fixed routine. We all get up at nine. You know, I actually believe some routine and then some flexibility are important. But I want you particularly to think about rituals. Okay. And what I mean by ritual isn't just, you know, the, the, the schedule of the day. And some routine is actually helpful. It helps keep um, the structure actually helps makes us feel safe. Right. So, so it is a good thing. But the rituals, those moments where we come together with our children, you know, a ritual for me is, is around dinner time. You know, we always eat five out of six out of seven days a week. We eat dinner at the table. Um, and it's a time the technology goes away. Sometimes the music's on. Uh, you may not be able to do that. You, you know, your lives are different. Um, what are your, what are your rituals? We have rituals around reading. You know, my, my daughter's older, so she now reads to me, <laughs> which I like. But what are the rituals? And so really taking those moments, especially if you're really finding yourself battling with your kids, um, finding those really nice ritual moments. And that fits into self-reg step five, by the way. So these fit into self-reg. So the second one I want to mention is micro environments, which we think about a lot in education and early childhood. It's where you have these little spaces in a, in a center or a school, um, a community center for different kinds of self-reg needs. So people tend to think it's self-break is always about calming down and blue lights and, you know, a deep breathing, but it can also be that some, that the very opposite and it can be the same kids and same adults need different things at different times. But what you can think about in your home is where are the nice spaces? Where is the, where are those little squirrel away zones that you can go or your kids can go? Um, fort building is a great one, you know, throw out some stuff and let them fort build. You can see I put time into my background here. It's a nice area that I like to, to be in. I like to have my coffee on the floor by the fireplace there every day. So just thinking about your environment and I'm not asking you to put pressure on yourself. That's the last thing you need. You know, if you, if you don't, if you feel exhausted right now, I'm going to get to number three, which is that recognize that. So this isn't about more work for you, but it's just beginning to think about what are the little space or what's the one space in my room, in my house that, you know, is, is, is a feel good space right now. Um, and what more can I do around that? And then the third one is self care, right? Self reg. When we say it starts with self, it starts with you. And if you're getting grumpy with people around you, be kind to yourself. That, that's because you're dysregulated. And, you know, that's because you're not feeling your best self. And so what can you do? And it's not a one size fits all. Not everybody wants to go have a hot bubble bath. <laughs> what is it that makes you feel better? Where can you get those few moments for yourself? You know, to lend our calm, we have to feel calm. And that that's not being selfish. It's the most generous thing you can do for the folks around you, you know, and sometimes that's saying no. Uh, sometimes that's saying I, you know, I've said to my daughter, I can't, can't do the reading tonight. I need to go read for myself, you know, and she gets that. Um, so those are just three things that you could try. Well, the very first one was just think, have a look at your routines and think about, think about this idea of rituals, these times when you're really together, right? There's no technology anywhere near any of you. <laughs> You know, those, those little bits of time, little bits of time can make a big difference. The second one is think about your environment. What little things can you do um, to make you all feel safe and grounded and connected? And the third one is, is you. You matter. And uh, I hope you find ways to care for yourself through COVID-19 and, uh, and beyond. So Stuart, it's final word to you. Would you like to respond to anything I just shared? Um, add, how would you like to close up our first of what I hope will be, uh, will be more webinars for oh. the, our Polish folks. So I absolutely love what you said. Uh, and I'm reluctant to add anything that, because it might detract. So I only have one last thing to say. Do widzenia. <laughs>
Okay, and forgive me if, if, if my accent is atrocious, you can put your hands over your ears like my grandmother used to do. <laughs> if you have any questions for us, you can reach out to our new organization, Self-Reg Global, at CEO at selfregglobal.com. I will be on the other end of that, and we'd be happy to hear from you. And please reach out to buy those books, those Polish books from our Polish publisher, and we, we hope you are well. We're thinking of you. Our hearts are with you. And uh, thank you for your interest in Selfreg.